Digital Anxious Reboot 2020 event. Um, so just to help you uh, know what to expect for this session moving forward. So um, over the next hour, um, we are going to um, first of all, give you a bit of a background to, to Reboot and what this is. I'm going to briefly mention the manifesto. I'm then going to um, enter into a discussion with um, our, our main guest today. Um, that is uh, John and Sandy. I'll introduce them shortly. We will have the opportunity uh, briefly for, for Q and A's at the end for, for a more discursive um, activity. And then we anticipate this event coming to a close at half past 10. So um, before I jump into it, um, just in terms of rules of engagement, if everyone could uh, mute themselves during the, the course of the conversation until we get to Q and A. If, uh, however, you'd, you'd like to uh, comment or join in the conversation, or if you think I have a question, uh, but you might forget it over, over the course of the discussion, use the chat pane on the side, um, uh, put your questions in there, and between Joe and Duncan and I will we'll field those questions. And in the Q&A session, please also feel free to use the um, raise a hand feature. Uh, and that way we can identify who uh, would like to uh, ask any questions. So, um, can I just first of all thank you everyone for attending. Um, the the number of thumbnails appearing in front of me is getting uh, more and more and more. So I'm really pleased to see so many people uh, attending attending and coming along today. So let's begin. So in terms of the uh, the idea of reboot 2020. Um, uh, <clears throat> This is, some of you may or may not have known that this, at the beginning of the year, when, when things were once upon a time quite normal, we uh, had a great big ambition to bring to Lancashire a digital festival, a big fanfare, a great big celebration of um, all things digital, all things Lancashire, and to champion that. And as we got further into the year and things got more and more challenging and more and more difficult, um, I was still recklessly thinking, let's still have a festival. Um, but of course, as, as we got near the day, it, it became more and more challenging. So um, a, a discussion around the board, we, we, we knew we wanted to do something. We knew we couldn't do a festival to the scale uh, and ambition of what we wanted initially. However, it became absolutely clear that um, something was needed to get a, an honest appraisal, a snapshot of where we are currently up to both in terms of the sector, both in terms of where we're up to in Lancashire. And the idea of, of, of a reboot just felt perfectly natural. So hence, Digital Lancashire's Reboot 2020 was born. Um, and over the next three days, there's going to be a number of sessions focusing on uh, a few key areas. So what I would urge people is, um, if you uh, haven't seen the full suite of activities of things that are happening, if you head to um, our website on digital-langshire.org.uk slash reboot2020. Um, there you will see not only all the links uh, to the events and the uh, Eventbrite registration, every event to attend is free for this particular forum. Um, on there, you will also see um, and find our, our manifesto, um, Digital Lancashire Manifesto, which really is our, our statements of aims and ambitions, the things that we want to achieve in the region. So whether that is around influence and collaboration or around engaging support or working with academia or advice and guidance to technical hubs, there's a number of things that we are currently active, things that we do. Um, some of the things you will know about, some of the things you'll have no idea, but we work tirelessly in the background to, to make things happen. So we have our manifesto. Um, and what I would say, one of the key ambitions of the Reboot 2020 is, is to make sure that after this week, that our manifesto is aligned with what people need, what people expect. Um, because actually when, when we put together the manifesto, the landscape was very, very different. So uh, if you head to the Reboot page, um, on there you will find our manifesto, which you can download. You will also find um, an event guide for, for Reboot. So just to Okay, we're just waiting for, oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. 
I, so, I, I, I thought I'd been kicked out for talking too much then. I thought, well, what a great start. So, um, but back in the room. So um, what I would say about the event, uh, just to give you a, a brief overview of the sorts of things um, that will happen over the next three days. We have a number of events that are focused very much on uh, what we call our clusters, or the areas, uh, places in Lancashire where activities has naturally emerged. So, uh, for example, we have a, a digital reboot press event. We have one around Lancaster, around Burnley, around an, a number of places. And in those discussions, um, we are looking to really put a finger on the pulse of the matters, issues, challenges, and success stories that, have, uh, that are pertinent to that place. So that, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use Preston as an example. You might find it's a bit of bias. I'm, I'm a Preston boy. Um, but in the Digital Reboot 20, uh, Preston session, we would uh, seek to identify um, what challenges in particular we face in Preston. What are the uh, issues that make things either um, more difficult for us or things that, that propel us and conversely I think it's really important in those discussions to um, get a good handle on what are the things that that particular area does really well um, because I think and I'm sure I'm not alone when I think this that we have so many good companies and things that happen in Lancashire yet we are fairly um, what's the better word than terrible at telling people about it um, so I, I think there is so much we can do to champion Lancashire and shine a brighter spotlight. Um, so it, it, the idea is after those sorts of discussions, we have a really good clear picture of how we can support you in that area, in that sector, in that cluster, um, and how we can champion you to potentially um, draw funding down for support programmes or whatever that thing may be. Outside of the cluster uh, sessions we have going on over the next three days, we have um, more thematic, more things that are perhaps focused on um, general working lives. So, for example, we have uh, a really interesting session coming up uh, about the hybrid workplace. So being that many of us have been um, working uh, between home, the office and or anywhere else over the last few months, the landscape for what the workplace looks like is really very, very different. So uh, we're, we're gonna have um, a fascinating discussion around what that actually looks like. Um, elsewhere, we are, we've got a, uh, an event focusing on, uh, well, events focusing on diversity and inclusion and race and, and really holding up uh, a mirror to ourselves like just to, to see uh, what are we doing to uh, better that situation, to prove it, to facilitate, to help, all, all of those things. So. Um, we have the focus on working lives. We also have um, a really interesting event coming to, um, uh, called Sparks, which is uh, going to be a series of lightning talks, which if you've never uh, participated or never been, please do sign up to these. These are brilliant. Um, also fairly evil. So the, the, the outline of a Sparks event is the participants um, volunteer themselves. I say volunteer themselves. There might be a couple of people I have picked on and asked to, to, to present a Sparks presentation. Um, and it's, that person will get five minutes. They have 20 slides, 15 seconds per slide, absolutely strict. No deal. If, if you are talking too much, that slide continues regardless and your presentation ends up five minutes on the nose. Um, so we have, uh, we've managed to cultivate a selection of really great, interesting, um, presentations, really quick, rapid fire. So really focusing on, on innovation and invention and the, I suppose, the digital creativity that we, that we have in Lancashire. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And then um, we also have an event around um, a focus on Lancashire. So we, um, when you're in the guide, look for an event called the Digital Union. And this event, um, which I'm, I'm really pleased we've, we've managed to put together, puts into the room um, the, the, um, the heads or people from um, key organisations in Lancashire um, because we um, have identified that whether you are us at Digital Lancashire or Marketing Lancashire, Digital Lan um, Creative Lancashire, or all these bodies in Lancashire that are doing things to try and help their sector um, are doing great things, but sometimes we do it 
um, siloed. Certainly over the last six months, it's made it more difficult to have those open lines of communication. So the Digital Union aims to bring together all of these people to get a better understanding of who they are, what they're doing, and really critically, how we can work more effectively together and communicate more effectively in the future to, to make sure that we are not doubling up on efforts and to make sure that all the effort we are putting into things is uh, having the most positive and best outcome. And um, the, the final thing that I'd, I'd like to mention about the Reboot 2020 is um, the event we have focused on, on, on future. A bit of, not navel gazing, uh, crystal ball gazing, a bit of futurology. So um, really the, uh, the um, I suppose, a natural outcome of something like a reboot is, okay, well, this is where we're at. What next? Because I'm fairly certain the what next at the moment is very different to what next was seven or eight months ago. So that is a, a whistle stop tour of the, uh, the reboot plan for 2020. So um, at this point, um, what I'd like to do is introduce everybody to our, our guest today. And um, I'm going to have a, a, a discussion with, with these two around uh, all things digital. And like I say, um, there will be a chance to uh, ask questions or get involved in the discussion in the, in the chat pane. So um, we have with us today um, Dr. John Ashcroft, um, who has a considerable number of letters after his name, uh, so, uh, like PhD, BSc, FRSA, C lots and lots of them. So um, very established. And John specializes in economic strategy and uh, financial markets. Is the author of the Saturday Economist Live, which is, um, sorry, a, a, an author of the Saturday Economist, which is a weekly update on the UK and world economy. And John also presents the Saturday Economist Live. So it is, I'm sure John will, will say lots of things about himself. So um, John, if I can just get you to say hello so we can identify you in the grid and, and who and where you are. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, here in sunny Manchester. It's a great day in Manchester, so I'm right in the middle of Manchester. So it's great to be with you this morning. Thanks for inviting me to be part of your digital reboot. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And the uh, other guest who um, I'm going to bring to the discussion is uh, Sand Sandy Finlay, who is the Partnership Director uh, um, at Supporters and Partners of Digital Lancashire, ABGI. So, Sandy, if I can get you to... Um, <laughs> there he is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, morning, everybody. Thanks for having me along. Uh, I'm uh, coming live from uh, less than sunny Edinburgh. <laughs> it's it's bright just now, but I think there's a, a, a pretty heavy rainstorm on its way. So uh, I've, I've moved into a room today rather than yesterday morning. Uh, I thought I was being smart, went into our conservatory, started a web conference, and within three minutes had to move because the rain was so heavy, people couldn't hear me. <laughs> so... We've avoided that today. Well, good. Well, it's, it's not looking too bad outside my window. So um, and just to give a bit of background, so Sandy, like I say, is the partnership director at ABG. He's got 21 years uh, consulting experience in business strategy, marketing um, and international business, and uh, is a former visiting lecturer in international business marketing at Napier University of Edinburgh. Um, so uh, to hopefully, um, I'm sure Sandy will bring uh, um, extensive expertise in, in those areas. So... With that in mind, and Sandy, I'm, I'm going to just pick on you first, just because you were the last person I, I spoke to it in that line. So um, I suppose, how important is digitally in your own personal ecosystem? Um, uh, yeah, um, well, it's if you had asked me nine months ago, I pr probably would have said, yeah, it's, it's important, but not um, the most important thing in, in our businesses. Uh, um, ecosystem the last seven months have changed that considerably because i think like most people um what the last seven months have done has done for us is um accelerated the adoption of digital uh we're now using i don't know about education platforms to stay in touch uh, our our workforce of 50 sorry i should say we're a um a, um professional services company we're a consulting company we work with our clients to help accelerate their innovation activity. And uh, so within two days, uh, the week prior to government announcing lockdown, we had implemented a business continuity strategy we've had in place for five years, and we had 50 staff working from home. So the last um, 
the last seven months have been quite a revolution for us because going from a business where we had 40 staff in our office in Edinburgh and uh, another 10 Oh, uh, I, we, we temporarily lost Sandy though. It, lo it looks like the internet to Scotland has broken. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so just in the interim then, um, if I can throw it over to you, John, I suppose the same question really, in terms of um, the impact of digital in, in, in what you do on day-to-day, on, on -day, but um, <laughs> and also um, to, to your business, how, what sort of impact has it had for you? I think it's... Um... Pretty much the same story for everyone. I got a great quote from Lenin, I must share with you. He said, Lenin said, there are decades where nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. And I think that's so true of what's happened with the since the shutdown. We've seen this massive acceleration and change in retail and retail online. And so these it's, it's been a, a really dramatic change over the last three or four months. So it's in a way it's the same for me. I, I stopped working full time as chief executive of Pro Manchester at the end of 2018. Um, and so one of the first things I did was set up my home office. And no, it's not, not so much a home office, but it's more like a home studio. So my wife reckons it looks like a news night production set, but uh, I'm a great gadget guy. So yeah, so a lot of the stuff I was doing were presentations uh, to groups of people, working with clients and to groups of 100, 150 people. And also we had a series of regular lunches and obviously that could not happen. So I think that, um, yeah, it's an acceleration to move online. So. I've been doing my study economist blog for 10 years now. Um, it started out when I first came back to Manchester as the Sunday Times of Quessels. I'd write and talk about my experience in the week and I'd talk so much about economics, it morphed into economics. So that's been going on for 10 weeks, but what, no, for 10 years, what, what we tried to do is take it far more digital. So doing the podcast, regular podcast, and doing a series of uh, videos for the, the study economist live, trying to do that as a, a monthly uh, show. So yeah, it's the same, I think, to you know, that investment in digital, in, in virtual, and uh, the move to the cloud has been so dramatic, but it's just been accelerating over the period of shutdown. I, absolutely, and I, I can certainly, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure everyone is familiar with that, um, like Sandy mentioned there, so this, this dramatic uh, acceleration. So um, Sandy, if I can just bring it back to you. Um, you, you mentioned there that you managed, because you had this, uh, the, the business continuity plan that was implemented and you did, you were able to get um, everyone within two days, which um, hats off, that's, that's, that's impressive. Did, what about your um, clients and the people who were, do, do you think businesses were ready for, for the, the, the breakneck speed? of change? No, I, I don't think many of us really were. Um, we've done a lot of talking over the last um, 10 years about digital transformation and digitization of business. I think a lot of that was words and lip service. Um, so I think um, the clients, we work primarily across engineering, manufacturing, software technology. Uh, there are two biggest areas, but we work across all sectors. And the, our experience is that most sectors uh, in the UK were taken by surprise and were caught out with uh, the, the rapid change they had to go through the evolution in their business models, yeah. And how, how about you, John, with, uh, with the, the people you work with, with, with people you've interviewed, what, what's been your take on, on how people have reacted, certainly in, in the initial days and weeks of, of lockdown and these unusual conditions that people found themselves in? I think it's um, been pretty mixed really. I mean there were those who were, who were <clears throat> more advanced so we'd done a lot of work in terms of of moving to the cloud and moving to virtual working and flexible working and made sure everybody had the right kind of kit and equipment <clears throat> with, when I was at Pro Manchester. So that move to, to, to virtual move to the cloud was taking place but for some businesses and, and so the scale of which has been so incredible I, it's been a complete shock. I know that um, a good friend of mine who works for one of the big uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, they, they were sort of finding out that, you know, some of their, their employees working from home didn't have a desk or they wouldn't, think they wouldn't have a laptop and they would not have a desk, they wouldn't have a place to work. So they had a, a lot of basic investment in terms of making sure that people had the right kind of kit. And I think that now it's sort of accelerating pace. There's a great new term coming up called HR is now head of remote. <laughs> Great new jobs we've so if you want sort of instead of classic HR, this head of remote is responsible for making sure that the people are remain engaged and uh, are fully engaged and have the right kind of kit and equipment and retain fully motivated and 
looking after welfare. So it's a very pattern across the board, really. Some were better equipped and some businesses more, e more easily equipped to, or in the right sector to make that move. But yeah, it's been a mixed picture. But it, I think it's amazing how, you know, this, this acceleration of platforms. I mean, I'm a digital freak, really. So um, I think, you know, the stuff like Teams or uh, FB Workplace or Zoom or we, we have clients who will use GoToWebinar and then also use Teams and also use Zoom. So it's quite tricky knowing which button to press sometimes when I'm presenting. <laughs> but yeah, so I think, yeah, it's a mixed picture across the board. But in some ways, it's, you know, you read, I, best thing is to avoid reading the news because looking at the way forward, it can be so exciting. So many great apps coming forward. It's really quite, quite exciting, I think. I, I absolutely and in terms um just coming back back to you Sandy around this I suppose this retrospect or, or looking back have you identified over the last six months um things that have emerged is Sandy still oh no there's Sandy yeah, you, yeah, yeah I'm here Tom uh, apologies <laughs> you moved on my grid then and I thought for a minute that you'd, you'd been cut off again my apologies so uh, my question again sorry to just to repeat that is, is have you identified any emerging themes in terms of um, something more uh, on the digital economy over the last six months? Um, I suppose there are a number of emerging streams or themes, you know, um, the sectors we work across. Uh, the obvious one is um, AI and automation. So uh, th there's a real focus on uh, accelerating the adoption of AI and automating more processes. So I think in the next few years, we're all familiar with fintech, legal tech, reg tech, I think will be more um, industrial or sector focus uh, um, niches that, that develop in the next few years. I think that that adoption of AI automation uh, combined with robotics in terms of the, the industrial uh, part of, of our economy and, and manufacturing will be quite significant as well. One of the big issues this year for uh, the trade associations that are working in engineering manufacturing is around how they use digital transformation to, um, to really be incisive and uh, do the cost reduction part because a lot of manufacturing just now is, is desperate to cut cost out of their, um, uh, their operations. And one of the most effective ways of doing that is digital transformation. So all of the big associations we work with in partnership with uh, across the UK uh, the focus now is is on well, let's look at the whole digitization process L let's look at it from design right through to product going out the door and how do you use digital to streamline that process rationalize it and then take out the low or the non-value add parts uh, to, to improve the uh, efficiency and uh, uh, competitiveness of the industry yeah and do you anticipate being that you work in the um, sort of research and development area and and that Find, helping companies sort of claim back on, on that. Do you, or have you seen an, an, an increase in the uptake of that, given that people are having to be more innovative, given that people are having, like you say, to uh, have identified those mm -hmm. solutions and um, for the for all the awfulness that the last seven months has brought, and I hope I'm, I don't feel, uh, I feel quite awful for saying so, but has it presented um, opportunity for innovation? And have you seen an increase of, I suppose, the, of those things people applying for the r d uh, credits because they're being so innovative we haven't seen that increase as yet but um the, the r d tax relief industry runs 12 months behind uh, real life because people are are just now claiming relief on the money they spent last year on r d projects so we won't see that for probably another six months but in reality yes i think uh the first six months were just taken up with survival. Most of the companies we worked with were uh, uh, kicked into survival mode. How do we keep staff working? How do we keep our company operating? I think in the last uh, maybe three months, there's a turn there. And now companies are looking at what are the new opportunities that have come out of the last six months? Uh, how do we use digital to create new business models or new revenue models? How do we work where in digital to improve the robustness and the resilience going forward. And I think that will drive all of these new projects. So certainly a lot more interest in the marketplace and companies taking up uh, grants such as Innovate UK. 
Um, so that's a sign that companies are looking at new projects or new proposals. We haven't seen it on the R&D side. What we have seen is an increase in companies who are looking for um, funding to support their innovation activities. So grants, commercial funding as well. A lot more interest in, uh, uh, we have a couple of partners who provide quite unusual for, uh, sources of commercial funding, and we're seeing much more interest in those in the last couple of months. Yeah. Fascinating. Like, I quite the, the like say from going from survival through to opportunities through to uh, new revenue models. I, I find that fascinating. And uh, so, John, if I if I can bring it back to you in, in terms of, I suppose really that you know, this uh, this idea of going from survival to opportunity is a degree of uh, I suppose resilience um, that some people have had um, their hand forced. So, how do you um, in the times ahead? How do you think we we could or should develop more resilience uh, certainly g given the the the, the new um, tiered lockdowns you know, how as digital people organizations or companies do we become more resilient to, to change that happens around us yeah i think just echo what sunny was saying i mean the first wave it was all about uh, cash focus on cash and focus on survival and really taking a hard look at you know having been through several recessions look at taking a hard look at your own workforce and trying to work out how many people you're going to be able to bring through this crisis. So uh, then now we're into the sort of, you know, the second stage where we're beginning to look to 2021, certainly from Easter next year, let's say, but uh, we're going to be in some clear ground there. But looking at the challenges, it, it's really brought to the focus the challenge of digital disruption, really. So we, we've written extensively, researched extensively on DD and digital disruption last year, but last November, I was in Moscow as a guest of Gazprom, uh, speaking at the annual conference, and the focus was all about digital disruption and the challenge of digital disruption. And I think when we look at the sectors that Sandy talked about, fintech and so on, we're talking about manufacturing and robotics, that we've seen the challenge of DD and what it's done to the retail sector at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then there's a question of you know working from home and is this the death of the office? Will the tumbleweed blow over Canary Wharf anytime soon? So it, it's the same framework. I, when, in, and I work, I talk about um, CBS News as a, as a like, port of five force. You talk about con competitors, buyers, suppliers, uh, together with new products and new players. And here we've got bringing to the fore the real challenge of uh, the, the move online, the move virtual, the challenge of D, the big D, and how that ram the ramifications through every sector. So. In a way, it's the same framework of analysis. It's the same challenges we face. And this particular crisis is, is something that's uh, brought it to a, a head very quickly. Again, reiterating, you know, so much has happened uh, in retail. They will talk about stuff taking place, three years or five years development being compressed into three years. So it's the same framework of analysis. And it's the same challenges we face, but the big kick is DD and so, you know, the stuff written on, on the stuff, a lot of stuff written on the website on on digital disruption two or three years ago mm. that just applies and pushes into 2021. So it's really a big rinse. I mean, it's a big, big uh, uh, productivity rinse that we're going to expect in 2021. Yeah, absolutely. You, you talked about there being the the say problems of the, the same analysis. So I so I. I uh, I acknowledge that the things there is a degree of same, but if we if you had your great big uh, digital magic wand and you you could reboot everything, if if things could be recreated in in John's ideal digital world, um, what does what does twenty twenty one look like in in a sense of in in a in a best case scenario in in terms of digital in terms of um, I think Sandy mentioned earlier about one of the challenges around moving to uh, a more hybrid workplace or working from home often is around the the, the kit that's available to you or the um, ability to, to navigate these platforms. So, for, for example, um, to put this very long question into context for you, um, Lancashire's um, digital workforce, by comparison to the rest of the UK, is is much much older so um in terms of this this perfect digital um rebuild digital sex for 21 what what does it look like and, and how can we make sure that, that everyone is catered for impossible question for you to answer john but i would love to have you to have a go at it 
Well, I think it, it's, it comes out, again, it comes back, back to the structural stuff. You know, you, you, you look at your competitive framework and do this analysis we talk about, again, CBS News, competitors, buyers, suppliers, new products, new players. And then you look at the sort of differential challenges in terms of that political, the pestel framework, all classic strategy stuff. But I think it comes back to the focus on the organization itself. Age is no is no is is no of no value in this environment because the pace of change is so exciting and it's accelerating. And what the, the message has got to be, yeah, do your framework analysis and look at the classic challenges, but you've got to make sure that your organization is lean, flexible, and always learning. It's got to learn to learn and it's got to learn to adapt. And we talk about the age of the hippo, you know, the highest paid person's opinion of being dominant in the past. The age of the hippo has gone. It's got to have a flexible team-based environment where people are, are, are sharing and learning and understanding the challenge they're facing. So it's all about flattening the structures, opening up communication and confronting or have the sensitivity out there with the uh, confronting the challenges that face. So in some ways, this move has made it even more stimulating because there are so many great apps around for team working and for data sharing and, you know, Personally, I can never understand why somebody got paid to teach people how to get things done, you know, with this GTD stuff. But in terms of, I, I love a checklist of things I have to do, but I end up throwing them away. I need a checklist of checklists that I've used in the past because there are always new things coming up and I can't resist the lure of a, a new app to test it out. So I think it, it's about this element of flexibility. Organizations have got to be flexible and they've got to be learning and they've got to have, uh, ensure that analysis or that methodology, that framework, that mentality seeps into every facet of the organisation. Brilliant. So there, there are so many sound. I was, I was scribbling sound bites there. So the, the fact that age is no value, I think, is um, uh, in this environment at least, is a, is a fascinating insight. I, I think, and I quite like the idea that companies need to be lean and flexible and always learning. In fact, we need to, we need to learn to learn. So Sandy, if I can, you mentioned earlier, like taking a workforce of 40, 50 people. Um, and putting them, uh, everyone's active within that 48 hour window. In regards to your, your colleagues, associates, or, or partners, how how do you um, how did you get them to embrace digital in that way? How come you were so ready to make sure that everyone was good to go from from the, the starting line? Uh, well, we've been we've been working on it for three or five years now. The, the business continuity strategy has been in place five years and I suppose it's taken us that long we didn't do it in in two days um, so we have a, a number of staff who work remotely uh, working from their homes um, it's you know since I joined the company six years ago we've been investing in technology that that actually makes it easier for people to work from home so six years ago we had a CRM system that was clunky it took uh, sometimes three minutes to log on to if you were working from your home sales guys never logged on. So now we have a system that's uh, cloud-based that, that uh, boots up as soon as they switch the laptops on in the morning. They, they don't see that. There is still a slight delay. It takes a couple of seconds rather than three minutes now, but there's still that delay there. They don't see it because they're booting up and they're busy drinking their coffee and watching um, Naga Manchetti on BBC uh, Breakfast. Um, <laughs> We, we installed a, a, an enterprise level comm system uh, in January, which actually is voice over internet. It combines, have you guys gone again? Am I still online, yeah? I'm here, you're still there. Great, sorry, I just, all the pictures suddenly went for a second. I thought my daughter's watching Netflix. Uh, <laughs> so um, we installed, installed the VoIP, we connected it to, to mobile phones. And from uh, January, Everybody, no matter where they are in the country, if somebody calls their desk phone, their mobile rings. So again, in March, it wasn't a significant jump for us. We already had that technology. The real challenge in March was on uh, 8.30 on the Tuesday morning, our MD had said, we want to everybody working from home by Wednesday afternoon. And our IT guy phoned us and said, none of the telesales team have laptops. So I need to get all of their PCs, their desks, uh, machines to their homes uh, and we only have nine telesales uh, staff so uh, the MD just said just go and buy nine laptops you know get the spec you need get onto Apple get the laptops in so that was that was a mini obstacle for us you know what it, 
th there was nothing that came up that was significant because the minute we went home, we had our enterprise level VoIP system, which gave us uh, video conferencing. Uh, you know, everybody's got Zoom. Uh, all of our uh, central um, apps, all of the apps we use at a, a business level, the business critical stuff, were all cloud-based anyway. We've been doing that over the last three years. So it, it wasn't a significant jump for us. It was all part of the evolution. Um, what it did do was it proved that our business continuity strategy was robust and practical. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure your IT team had a great time at 8.30 on that Tuesday morning. So um, hats off to them and, and, and the team, maybe uh, Jaffa. He's, he's the star of the last six months guy <laughs> and he's the star of the last six months i promise you but the other thing is for the last couple of years we've been using remote um remote access so again no matter where you are in the country if you've got access to internet if you have problems with your with any part of the it system brian can get in and help you out and that's been invaluable um mm -hmm. over the last six months because it means that all of the staff working from home no matter how it literate or competent they are they know they've got Brian just, you know, three seconds away or six seconds away. Yeah, it, 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 interesting that those that those things um, we become so familiar to those support um, systems, whether whether it's the go to IT guy or uh, where, where to go for help on Zoom. And um, John, if I if I can just bring it um, back to you in, in terms of um, I touched on it earlier in, in terms of well, what we did just earlier was look into the future, but. During the last six or seven months, has, has, has anything on you? What's been the biggest surprise? Because I think there are things that we expected, or things that we anticipated, or like ABGI, where they they had a mechanism in place to, to deal with with such an environment or a shift in change. But for you, John, what's what's been the biggest surprise of in in, ter, in, in a digital context? What what's emerged to be the thing that you, maybe you didn't see coming, or perhaps you hadn't anticipated? I think it's going to be the, um, the the whole teleconferencing scene and the emergence of Zoom, really. Because I think that, you know, the the success of Zoom, because we were experimenting, I was experimenting with blue jeans prior to a lot, at the end of last year, but just the the way people have accepted the online uh, communication and the use of the apps, whether it's Teams or, um, or particularly Zoom. So yeah, it's the way in which that infrastructure, people have accepted that as now, has been the norm, the new norm. So, yeah, that and the success of government in being outstanding, offering outstanding leadership and insight as we weave through this crisis. Yeah, uh, that's a bit of cynicism there. But. No, um, and um, just Sandy, if I can just bring you back to um, interesting point you made about the 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 IT guy, who um, is. In many cases, the the, the new saviour, the, the 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 one of the most one of the key people in many organisations now. So whether it is uh, laptops not working or internet connections being dodgy or or whatever it is, the the IT guy becomes a an um, perhaps an even more critical part of, of, of that chain. So is there is there a risk, or uh, do you think for businesses of having that single point of failure? Not not with that I I I expect that happening, but if if we rely so heavily on that on that one person, is there is there anything in your plan that helps mitigate that? So it's a question, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think uh, there are a couple of fail points in most businesses. There are functions which we rely on but don't necessarily value that much. And I think up until March, yes, uh, our IT support was probably a critical fail point because we only have Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian has always done his best to make sure uh, that if anything ever happened to him, there were other parties we could rely on. You know, we, we do have plugins for different parts. There's nobody that does the full job he does. But one of the things it has done for us as a management team in the last six months has highlighted that. And, and again, part of our um, our uh, risk assessment and uh, resource planning for the next year is, okay, how do we put a safeguard in? So if anything ever happens to Brian, we know we've got that continuity support. It, last year, that wasn't an issue in risk planning because we never ever envisaged COVID and the digital disruption. So uh, yeah, I think there are a number of uh, points 
uh, fail points or potential fail points in businesses. And it's not until you're faced with the issue um, that it becomes significant. Yeah. So IT was just some, Brian just was always yeah. in the, in the back office, you know, a bit like the guys in the IT crowd, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, I suppose a, a golden takeaway from that is um, treasure your Brian's people. Yeah. Um, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely uh, critical. So, um, before I open the, the the floor to a a, a Q and A, John, if I if I can if I can come back to you, um, I'd imagine you you've taken part in in lots of these sorts of discussions and forums, um, whether digital focused, whether COVID focused, whether um, future futurology focused, but um, how how useful are, are these sorts of events in in your experience to um, or I suppose, or rather, let, let me reframe that question. How do we stop these sorts of events from becoming just a discussion talking shop to uh, an acting change from them? Because that's one thing I'm, I'm really keen for all of these conversations we have, all the things that we glean, whether it's about um, the, the support available to us or ways in which we can better become more resilient. Um, <clears throat> how do we, I suppose, um, sorry, completely lost my train of thought there. I was lost in my, in my own thinking. Um, how do we make these sorts of events more meaningful? How do we make things happen after them? I think you've got to go um, theme specific, really. So it, it's good to look, for example, um, <clears throat> when we do, I was going to my social media phase. I, I was downloading so much stuff on social media. If there's like a you know 10 ways to tie your shoelaces using twitter i have got that pdf in my pack so but it's a question of being specific about the stuff so uh, again during the shutdown i was looking at so much of the, the best kit to have for home production in terms of you know the right camera the right audio the right lighting the right um, sound equipment the right podcast stuff it's having the right kit was became the focus to make sure because you look at a lot of even doing top tv interviews on tv the, the people, the participants are so, the lighting's bad, the camera angles are bad, but in terms of the kits, I was doing a lot on the kit, the best kit to have to do the uh, stuff. That's what you know, my wife says, it's like a new, new, new studio at the moment. But, I, was, I, was anyway, say, I think you've got a nice ring light going on there, but I, I suspect. I've got <laughs> heavy, heavy lighting, yeah, they're, they're, yeah they're, they're the heavy lightings, yeah, so the ring light, I had a ring light, but it was like, I was perspiring so much, I had to get rid of that one, but equally, you know, the right kind of makeup to, to use, but it's, so going back to your point, it's, it's looking at the, the agenda specific, whether it is the right kind of kit, whether it's a challenge of DD in certain industries, very much the focus is on, you know, in terms of um, the, the reiteration everyone has to go through, it's not just getting to from A to B and point B and thinking that's it, you've reached the summit, that's it. Mm. It's constantly challenging and looking at, you know, it was all about the user experience and the user journey. And I was doing a conference, they were talking about, uh, no, it's not UX and UJ, it's the product, it's the parcel experience and the parcel journey that you focus on. If in, mm. in retail, especially online retail, that Amazon has set the standards by which all others will be judged. And I think that we've seen incredible results from ASOS today and Boo and the online traders. Um, but they're constantly having to work and reiterate their model. So whether it's logistics, supply side logistics, whether it's the right kit to go online, whether it's the digital disruption challenge and how it affects certain sectors, it's, it's getting a more specific theme into the, uh, the exchanges as you move forward. So you, you're developing an agenda yeah. on the structure. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So yeah, around about themes and agendas, perfect. Um, and I do hope that for Reboot 2020, we, we, we have got those particular themes in mind, because like, like I say, I, I can't say enough that my my uh, absolute ideal outcome for the, the whole Reboot 2020 events is that um, the manifesto, which I mentioned earlier, um, changes. It, it changes and it adapts to, to what is important, is, is required to make us a more effective organisation supporting the digital sector now. I've, uh, there's a few questions that have popped up in chat. So, uh, Sandy, over to you for this one. So, um, uh, there's, there's a question here around how do you feel around about digital security issues, um, and are, how are you looking at those during this accelerated digital adoption period? Is uh, how how can we um, as organisations, I suppose, be more aware of the security issues that, that impacts that? Yeah. Well, speaking as a man who has one passport for everything. <laughs> Um, it, it is an issue, and I think um, is, it, is it one, two, three, four, Sandy? 
Oh, it's not that complicated. <laughs> it's zero, 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 zero. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I think as the acceleration of uh, digital and technology increases, we are becoming uh, much more susceptible or vulnerable. So uh, last year, uh, I was visiting the BSI Institute down in Hemel Hempstead. They now have a, a wing within BSI, which is dedicated specifically to IoT security. And uh, <laughs> they were telling some horror stories about uh, there was a bunch of hackers who were hacking into people's home systems via the remote controlled jacuzzis. <laughs> Why and if you need a remote controlled jacuzzi, I'm not sure, but um, because again, the makers of the jacuzzi had set the, um, the default password on the remote controls as 0000, zero, zero, zero mm. and nobody thought of ever changing it. There was an instance last year in America where one of the big manufacturers had to withdraw a line of um, web-enabled insulin pumps off the market because hackers were hacking in and remotely changing the dosages on patients' insulin, and it caused significant problems. So, mm. but it's it's things that most of us, as um, regular users, wouldn't imagine as being a problem. But I think as we as we see an in, the increase in interconnectivity and the the growth of the digital mesh, then that security becomes much more important. Um, I think the problem is a lot of naive, naive users just don't even consider that as a, as an mm. issue. And I think one of the things we need to do going forward is uh, um, the the digital in, um, sector needs to be raising that awareness and promoting Whoa. users. Yeah. Uh, and in, in regards to, I suppose, this cyber security issue, obviously because it's, it's more pertinent and there are more um, Brian's required now more than ever, is there an opportunity here to put uh, apprenticeships more firmly on, on the map? So as I mentioned in the chat, of, um, surely now, now is a, a great time to create opportunities in this area around security for apprentices, perhaps. I think I've always been a big supporter of apprenticeships. And I think um, when Britain effectively did away with apprenticeships in the 80s. It was, it was a, a significant step backwards in terms of our industrial strategy and our, our economic strategy. Uh, but that's, that's another issue. Um, I, I think the questioner actually says, you know, it's, there, was some, there was a response there about um, apprenticeships take a while to, to work through because most apprenticeships are three years. I think apprenticeships is one of the um, parts the other things we can do, though, another part of the solution is more digital buddying. So um, it, it comes back to what John was saying about turning the, the, the value um, pyramid on its head. Um, sometimes, I, I do it all the time in our office, I rely on uh, the 20 somethings to tell me how to use apps. Actually, I, I, I spoke to one of our software engineers near the start of lockdown, maybe the, the uh, four or six weeks into it, and I can't remember which app I was having problems with. He was on the phone and said, oh, Mark, can you tell me a bit about this? I'm having a problem doing this. And he says, Sandy, I'm a software engineer. He says, if you want to know how to get a, a so piece of software to learn at twice the speed it's currently learning at, I can tell you that. I haven't a clue about learn using apps. He says, go on one of the girls. <laughs> so I think if, you know, there, there's a combination of things there. There are people in our companies who already know how to use the technology we have. What we need to do is to identify the ones that are having problems and do some buddying up there. I think apprenticeships are a great idea because it combines some, um, some I'm going to use the wrong word here, but academic knowledge with practical experience. And I think that combination of, uh, of academic knowledge and, and real experience, you know, practical experience is invaluable. But that is going to take a couple of years to work through the system. Yeah, I, I really like the the, the, the the idea of digital buddying and, and something John mentioned earlier, which is we we need to to, to learn to, to learn um, effectively, <clears throat> it, which in itself is a core skill. Um, there's a really fascinating point raised here, John, that I'd like to kind of put your way because um, I know you, you're very much in the public speaking arena with your uh, blogs and podcasts and the the public engagements you do and. Um, was um, uh, so uh, I know that 
have we relaxed the rules in, in terms of so when, when it comes to something like this um a, a big zoom a, a big meeting have we relaxed the rules for the better during these times are we less uptight around protocols so uh, for example um you know a year ago if we had a meeting and then um suddenly you heard my cat meow my son or daughter came running to the room um that may have raised now but with these days it has it is it is it better now that we're less concerned about things that impact everyday life like that? I don't know. Less, we're less concerned. We're, we're more forgiving and more understanding. So I think you know the 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 <coughs> idea that there can be disruption, especially in a diversity environment. Yeah, but I don't think um, maybe the rules are relaxed a bit. Dress codes relaxed a bit. You know, is everybody wearing suitable clothing? and every part of their body, that kind of question. But yeah, <laughs> who knows? I think we're far more forgiving, far more understanding. And is it moved for the better? Well, the time will tell really. I mean, people will decide what they're prepared to accept and what they're not. Yeah. So, I'm not here stroking the cat because I haven't got a cat or a dog for that. <laughs> <laughs> Central Manchester. Yeah, it, interesting you mentioned the, the dress code there. For people who know me, um, me wearing a, a collared shirt today is, um, I wouldn't say it's a treat, I'd say it's an anomaly. I'm usually I'm usually t-shirts and scruffy, but I thought uh, for the reboot and for today, for, for all our guests, I, I, I would make that, that particular effort. Um, we're, we're soon to, to draw to a close. So what, if I can just, um, I suppose, get some final thoughts. And if I if I come to you, Sandy, on that. So if, if we can summarise the conversation really in, in the context of, um, I suppose a brief retrospective of your 2020 so far and what you what you hope for the the the, the following year in terms of whether it's about ABGI or for yourself and, and the digital sphere. Yeah. Um, well, um, you know, some of the best advances in history have brought about by um, by difficult circumstances and situations. And I think that's maybe a good summary of the last six months. We've had a, a very difficult time. What it has done is driven an acceleration digital uh, adoption. Um, probably, uh, you know, we, we, we've 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 adopted in the last six months, or we've we've moved in the last six months further than we might have in in the next five years if we didn't have this. So I think that's been a really positive thing. Uh, I think the changing culture is positive. I, I see it in our our team. So people are more relaxed. Um, do you know what? We don't have to wear a shirt and tie to advise people on their tax um uh, strategies or to give them the best advice you know the, the shortened time makes us feel more comfortable than the client i think sometimes mm. um going forward i think the 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 adoption and the integration of things like ai and automation uh, the internet of things um alongside of that the development of more robotics and by that i don't just mean on the shop floor i think robotics in in digital, digital as well. So things like chatbots um, and more automation in back office processes. I think all of those are going to create really exciting opportunities and are also going to change where we see value lines. So we employ some really clever guys to write reports for uh, companies who are claiming large amounts of money off the government. And I sometimes think, would we be better, rather than giving the HMRC 10 pages of narrative, would we be better giving them 10 bullet points on what they really want to know? You know, like mm. <laughs> this, this company de deserves 50,000 pounds because they did this this year. End of story. It saves our time. It saves HMRC's time. And I think some of the, those, those developments in technology will allow us to change those uh, value terms uh, and to redefine where value actually lies. So for me, that's really exciting. The other thing is the whole move to digital uh, I find much more exciting because before COVID, uh, I used to travel three weeks out of four and I was going to places, speaking at events. Uh, I will do a lot less traveling going forward. My wife's much happier about that. I think it adds more value for us as a company and for our partners because now I can do, well, I'm doing this event this morning. I'm doing an event with a bunch of companies in Manchester who are trying to access the American market this afternoon. And tomorrow morning, I can't even remember who I'm speaking to. <laughs> now, that was a whole week's work in February. And I've crammed it into one and a half days, <laughs> six months later. That's really exciting because I can get out to m m a lot more people. The other thing is, I think there's more intimacy in uh, web uh, events now because when I used to go to events and travel to them, if I was going from here to Manchester or London, um, it, you make this 
this mental calculation, well, if I'm going all that way, I need to speak to at least 20 companies. Mm -hmm. If I'm coming upstairs to one of my bedrooms and logging on, if I'm only speaking to six people, that it, it's the whole value thing again, isn't it? So I think what it is doing is it's driving more value into the um, communications we have. So uh, I can have more interactive, more responsive conversations this way. And it allows me to have much more intimate uh, um, discussions with um, users and, and potential clients. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, John, if we can get, if we can get your final thoughts, a similar um, kind of question. So in terms of your <clears throat> sort of personal retrospective on, on um, the, the year that was almost and what you, what your aims or hopes for the year ahead in digital. I think just going from an economics point of view, the, what we've seen is the shock to open to something like 20% in the second quarter. And then we see a progression by halves at the moment, barring a second big shutdown, but you know, a steady recovery. So when they talk about what shape will the recovery be, be then we always say it's a V, it's always been a V since 1933. So, you know, we're expecting this 20% setback in Q2, 10% in Q3, and maybe 5% in Q4, open down by 10% in a year with unfortunately a big rise in employment. But then from next year, especially from Easter next year, then it should be a strong recovery. But it's looking at those sectors that have been badly hit like hospitality and uh, food and accommodation. But even in those sectors, it's the impact of digital. So the head of IAG was at the conference last week and he was talking about the use of um, digital apps within the, uh, the hotel trade, whether it's not going into a bar in Manchester and ordering on your iPhone and it's brought to you. Mm -hmm. Your, your table. So it's looking at the shape of the recovery, the impact on the lagging sectors, uh, so some sectors that are racing away, some unfortunately are still in the depths of a uh, real big setback. Um, I look in the shape of the recovery, the sectors that are hit differentially, but in every area, in every facet, it's the challenge of, uh, of digital, the progress, not so much digital disruption, but the progress of digital and the sweeping changes that's making. So from a, a digital point of view, I think it's a very stimulating, exciting prospect as we move into 2021. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you uh, both Sandy and Sir John for, for your time and, and, and your thoughts. And thank you everyone for joining. Um, for me, I, I've scribbled a, a, a ton of notes there. Um, things I, I think are, are genuinely, for me around the digital budding or around identifying where we can be more resilient. So. Um, thank you so much. I, I think it's made for a, a great opening. Before um, I close today, just um, a, a reminder to people to check out the um, Digital Lancashire uh, Reboots section of the website. So that's digital-lancashire.org.uk slash reboots2020. All the events are there. So please do have a look at that. Please do have a look um, at our manifesto to see um, where, where you think we can potentially add value or if there are any gaps. Well, that's really, really what we want to know about that. Um, like I say, it's been a, a fascinating discussion today. Um, do tune in for the other, other things that are happening today. Um, at 12 o'clock, we've got the Making the Business Case for Inclusion and Diversity for Lancashire Businesses. Um, that's with the Tech Talent Charter. Um, we've also got the Digital uh, Burnley Reboot Session happening this afternoon. And um, if you are interested in the hybrid workplace, which is something we've touched on today, there is a session today going on at four o'clock. Um, we've got a really good panel with that. We've got, um, we've got Annie Chesworth, from, uh, the um, CEO and founder of Ecam. We've got Kat King from Society One. We've got Mish Bondesio, and we've got Jason King. So we've got a whole host of really interesting, good people. So um, do join us and also keep an eye on your inbox because we will be hounding you if possible for some feedback, both on Reboot, but also critically on, on where Digital Lancashire, Digital Lancashire can better support you moving forward. So um, thanks once more for, uh, for John, to Sandy, for all our sponsors and partners who've helped to make Re Reboot happen. And of course, everyone here for joining us today. So hopefully see you at another Reboot event very soon. Thank you very much.